good afternoon. My name is Kieran Hickman Lewis. I'm a geologist, I'm a microbial paleontologist, and my research focuses on achieving what I hope to be a more comprehensible comprehension of the most ancient traces of life on Earth, their settings, their environments, and the applicability of these findings to the potential existence of a fossil biosphere on the Noachian Mars. It's my opinion that we already have an alien planet for study at our fingertips. The most ancient rocks on this Earth represent vestiges of a planet shockingly different from that we know at present. Far from a state of relatively planetary clemency, we have a world where the skies were a dense, reducing haze, the oceans were a mildly acidic saline solution, the shorelines were fantastically black sands, the volcanoes and hydrothermal activity characterize everything where oxygen and its associated metabolisms could not possibly exist. Now, from a philosophical point of view, I think this constitutes a good trial run of how we look for biosignatures not on a world of our own understanding. So I'm interested in making comparisons between the Earth and Mars in their earliest history. Both of these planets appear to have supported limited habitable conditions, perhaps over relatively short geological timescales. Both had liquid water, vestiges of volcanic and hydrothermal impact. Uh, they, were, they were the victims of incessant impacts. It's our opinion that the short habitable timescales present on the ancient Mars and the ancient Earth mean that primitive chemotrophic metabolisms in a world of punctuated habitability are the most relevant analogues to study in terms of a Martian biosphere. That is why we find ourselves in the early Archean. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to go through these questions in some sort of order. What does it require to draw a biosignature from the ancient geological record? Where do we draw our boundaries between putative and definitive biosignatures? Once we've got those boundaries, how do we test the hypotheses of biogenicity that we create? And what are the implications there upon the search for life elsewhere? Chapter one, claims and refutations of unexpected biogenicity or my oldest fossils are older than your oldest fossils and the complications thereof. <laughs> so that's how the acronym goes. We have four places for studying the most ancient traces of life on Earth. Issua and Nuwagituk, which I will not talk about, uh, and, the Barb and, the, and the Barberton and the Pilbara, which I most certainly will talk about. The latter two present us with our, mm, our best preserved, though admittedly still imperfect, sedimentary sequences of the early Archean. In our quest for biosignatures, we seek out original conv convincing morphological traces of life, such as these cochoidal microorganisms from the Kitty's Gap chart. We reinterpret previous assertions of biogenicity, such as this reinterpretation of the apex chert non-fossils. We approach with new techniques, previously unrecognized uh, biological phenomena, such as these microbial structures from the apex chert. We search in ever more ancient rocks, ever more bizarre taphonomic windows, and ever further from home. Chapter two, principles of deep time. Recall the Archean Earth it produces a unique challenge for us geologists. There's a very different worldview to be had here. The early Eden hypothesis that we can find on the present day environments which are perfectly good for the existence of life may not necessarily be true for or even applicable to a distant alien world. This is because the principle of uniformitarianism, that the past is the key to the present, is pushed woefully beyond its limits in the Archean. Punctuated habitability is not a thing we know on Earth today, though individual life may be patchy in its habitability, life is pretty ubiquitous. And this leads to the fact that there are uninhabited habitats on the ancient Earth. Now that's something that we do not have on the modern day. Misapply either of these tenets of habitability, and you will find yourself in a world of mistaken conclusions and wayward assertions of biogenicity. These exist on all spatial scales. So in this microbe-oriented planetary analog, we will be considering phylogenetically primitive. Those are thermophilic chemotrophic organisms from such environments as in which they demonstrate endurance and recurrence over the geological time scale. Sadly, all analog environments on the modern Earth are somewhat compromised. Thus, it is prudent for us also to consider those environments which depict chemotrophic ecosystem dominance. That's the early Archean. Is it possible for us to make a comparison between post-oxygenated world e ecosystems? I don't know. That question I won't answer. Chapter 3, Drawing the Defining Line of Biodynicity. 
criteria. I study the record of carbonaceous matter in ancient sediments. We know that much of this carbon comes from the proven biological reservoir, but an equally great quantity can stem from terrestrial abiotic carbon factories. The youthful Earth was also under constant bombardment from perhaps up to 1,000 times present levels of meteoritic impact. And 7% of these impactors, the carbonaceous chondrites and micrometeorites, delivered vast quantities of a third sort of enigmatic carbon that I will comment no further on. Uh, can I go forward? Yes, I have gone forward too much. That slide apparently didn't work. OK, so I will, I will say that, therefore, in any aggregation of carbonaceous matter on the ancient Earth, you are potentially looking at a confusing melange of the three. How to draw a biosignature out of this? Someone at the recent ABSICON meeting, and I do wish I remember who, stated that biosignature acceptance is the summation of evidence and community consensus. The evidence we can, we can provide, the community sec consensus, comes from biodynicity criteria. We have criteria for microfossils, stromatolites, microbially induced sedimentary structures, microbial sediments, trace fossils, and organic carbon itself. I think if you look up those references, you will find 157 criteria that you can apply to your structures, and yet still the overlap between biology and abiology is vast. The next thing, we have to prove that these structures of whatever origin are syngenetic with their rocks. On the short term, things are very altered. On the medium term, things are tremendously altered. And go back in time, three and a half billion years ago, and you find, once again, a world that is far removed from the present. So let's suppose we have something that is putatively biological. We have something that is certainly as old as uh, we would like it to be. Ah, yes, there we go. That's another process of alteration. We then need to open the greatest can of worms, and that is biodynicity itself. Chapter 4, Sisyphean Myths versus Herculean Labors, or how to reliably extricate a biosignature from its lithic prism. Biosignatures can be classified by a tripartite division. Morphological signatures are doubtless the most iconic, but for every biological morphology, an abiotic doppelganger is lying in wait. As you will see, I have been very dishonest on this slide. <laughs> there you go. So the, the, bottom se the bottom section, those are in fact wonderful silica spheres, and this stromatolite is made of paint. <laughs> Morphological signatures of all scales. I told you all scales have... Goodness, that... Oh, no, that was a problem, and Microsoft PowerPoint has decided to close. Oh, actually it actually crashed. My presentation has more pictures in it than the National Gallery. I'm sorry. <laughs> Where was I? I was here. OK. So how about these beautiful microbial mats from the Huguenot? Well, they're on the right-hand side. What you find on the left-hand side is basically equivalent structures, but which have micron-scale peculiarities, which tell us that they are, in fact, abiotic. So morphological signatures on their own, not exactly ideal for our bipartite splitting of biology and abiology. Isotopic and metabolic signatures are becoming ever more useful. We have to tie morphology to geochemistry, and especially promising research direction seems to be sulfur isotopes, although also biomineralization. Third, chemical biosignatures, integral or disseminated organic molecules and biomarkers. Sadly, these are of no use to me because they're not nearly old enough. They only go back 2.7 billion years. Very young. So we come to the approach that I think ensures us a robust biological signature, correlative microscopy. A single line of morphological or isotopic evidence is no longer sufficient. You want morphology? I, oh dear, am I going to crash again? No, 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 OK. You want morphology, you start off with petrographic uh, observ observations, for example, of these chemotrophic colonies suspended in hydrothermal silica. You move your way to three-dimensional morphology, such as these confocal laser scanning microscopy images of putative microbial structures. You move closer. You move to tie chemistry to your morphology somewhat. Perhaps you'd like to put your sample into a CT scanner and get something akin to that. But that's only morphology. Perhaps you'd like to incl include some EDS mapping. You'd like to include some pixie analyses. You'd like to include Raman studies of the mineralogy. You'd like to include nanosims f for its isotopic mapping. This is difficult. Now, as you can see, we've got so much on the screen, we can hardly see the wood for the trees. 
what's important is choosing the appropriate combination of techniques for your biosignature of interest. Chapter five, critics versus cynics. Don't be a cynic. The burden of proof on ancient microfossils and their associated structures is a nigh interminable load. To give you the example of something I worked on, the apex chert microbial structures here, points in favor. Laminated textures which pass multiple morphological criteria for biogenicity, a Raman spectra consistent with the syngenicity of the structures with their host rock, nanosims showing the co-occurrence of three bioessential elements, points against. Proximity to a hydrothermal vein means that there's an increased chance of these structures stemming from a biogenically derived carbon. Also a point against, I can't find any microfossils here. The architects of these edifices are nowhere in sight. Chapter six, the defeat of absurdity. Null hypotheses or biosignatures on trial. An assertion of Archean or alien biogenicity is worthless without the simultaneous rejection of all conceivable null hypotheses. This is the geophilosophy part of the presentation. It's important not to reduce your evidence to a reductive stacking of the odds. All the best proofs of biogenicity are those which in the same breath are at once a demonstration of biology and an opprobrium to abiogenicity. For existence, uh, for instance, in the apex chert microbial st structures, I believe we have proven some characteristics of a concentration of organic molecules, which means that the morphological abiotic null hypothesis of tube pumice cannot possibly be true. Chapter seven, I promised you we'd get off the planet at some point, and we will, worlds beyond our own. So it's my opinion that the early Archean provides a planetary analog with microbial scale similarities to the Noachian Mars. We have numerous complexities to disentangle, and therefore we require a multi-approach technique. So many approaches that you crash PowerPoint multiple times. <laughs> this will doubtless be more difficult with the limited instrumentation that we will have on Mars. The range of biomes possible for fossil life on Mars will be greatly reduced relative to those on Earth. Coincidentally, the remaining biomes on this diagram are also those which were dominant on the Archean Earth. They're biomes which are controlled by internal heats and which thus favor the accumulation of chemotrophic biomass. The Martian rock record could also give us more than four billion years of unspoilt geological delight, and this sequence could be uninterrupted. It should be more pristine than on Earth once we make it into depth, and we can therefore start filling in the gaps of the horribly shattered terrestrial jigsaw. The understanding of the records of carbonaceous material is challenging. I think we are currently required to base a lot of our understanding of the Martian geological record in Earth-centric observations, but I'd like to see that reverse upon the return of Martian samples. Of course, a sample return mission to that end is absolutely necessary. We bring it back to Earth, we build a synchrotron around it, and we study the hell out of it. <laughs> Chapter seven, Ordentes Fortuna Adivat. The burden of proof associated with biosignature searches in the early Archean is monumental, but with care and diligence, the rewards can be reliable. Fortune favors the bold, and in our quest through the solar system, we should not and shall not go gently. Thank you for your attention. Okay, first off, let me say that is quite possibly one of the most riveting talks I've ever seen at a science conference. Um, secondly, so I study exoplanet biosignatures, and I find the idea of like coming up with the idea of biosignature plus evidence plus community consensus, you get your biosignature. So do you think you could, that could kind of be generalized to a sort of a general framework of how do we approach this? Because we're dealing with a lot of the same problems in the exoplanet community of, well, is oxygen a biosignature? Maybe. Yes. Maybe, maybe not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it certainly could, yes. I, th I, th I, th I, th I think a, a combination of evidence and communi community consensus is certainly what you require to be believed. I guess the issue with 
exoplanets is that it's more difficult to accrue great amounts of evidence. So community consensus on pivotal slices of that evidence is perhaps key in the equation for you. So on the slide where you had the, si uh, the slide that crashed uh, PowerPoint um, or with all the different uh, methods of finding Let's biosignatures, um, has any type of um, stepwise procedure or I don't know, almost like a dichotomous key of let's do this test, and if you get a good result, go to this test. Is anything like that under development? Broadly, you start off with your least destructive method, and you work your way to your most destructive. Um, I, I, I would say certainly for, well, yes, actually, actually, with the exception of reversing Raman and Pixie, that is the order I would do it in. It's always important to start off with the thin section microscopy because that is the scale of observation which is most, most, most meaningful to the resolution of the human eye. However, it's no longer enough. But for your studies in, involving SIMS and Pixie and one that I haven't put up there, a TEM, you'll, you'll, you will find that destruction means that has to be at, at the end of your chain. Yes. Always start with a thin section. Yeah. Do you think there's a fundamental problem comparing early Mars to early Earth since uh, Mars would have been much, much colder back then? Considering you have the faint young sun problem, mm -hmm. the paradox that people view as a problem for early Earth, it seems to be exacerbated if you look at early Mars. It's true, although the faint young sun is only a problem for phototrophic life. The, uh, the sorts of biomes I study on the early Earth are those which take their energy from the interior of the planet. So the faint young sun could probably be a problem right at the surface, but that depends upon the complexity you want for your ecosystem. In terms of the comparison between chemotrophic biomasses and chemotrophic ecosystems, I think localized conditions are much more important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.